on behalf of the Spring Hill Church of Christ, meeting at 405 Butler Street, I'm Mike Hughes, and we welcome you to another recording from the Spring Hill Church of Christ pulpit. This lesson, we are going to talk about drawing the line and what it happened to my pauses thing. A number of years ago, while living in Illinois, in Peoria, Illinois, I ate lunch with a few preachers. As I ate my helping and heaping plate of Chinese food, one of the brothers asked, when do we cross the line into materialism? He then told about someone he knew describing their their hosts, their cars, their vacation trips, and he was worried that they had become materialistic. The third preacher and I, we kind of, I guess, hemmed and hawed trying to sound profound, that, but only said, we don't really know. As we continued talking, I began to wonder, well, when do we cross the line into gossip? And then I got up picked up a second plate at the Chinese dollar a scoop buffet and wondered, when do we cross the line into gluttony? How many questions like this do we ask? How many times do we wonder, where do I draw the line? That's what we want to talk about in this lesson. Where do we draw the line? How do we know where to draw the line? Most of us know what the Scripture explicitly says, and we know the Bible, for example, condemns greed in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 11. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed. Paul says in Hebrews 10.25, we have the passage of Scripture that says, not neglecting the meeting together as the habit of some, but encourage one another all the more that you see the day drawing near. However, it's nev it never explicitly draws the line for when missing becomes forsaking. We know sexual immorality is com uh, completely wrong, but yet that question may come up. For example, Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4 the marriage, that marriage is to be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. However, the Bible never explicitly draws the line for when physical contact becomes sexually immoral. Where do we draw these lines on these subjects? Well, the problem is not merely academic, trying to find out word definitions and drawing boxes around specific meanings. And uh, this problem is potentially soul chattering because of the nature of sin. In Romans chapter 7, Beginning in verse 7, we see what Paul says along this line in Romans chapter 7 and in verse 7. What then shall we say? That the law is sin by no means. 
Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said you shall not covet. But sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. He says in verse 10, the very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteousness and good, righteous and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin. Through the commandment might become sinful, he says, beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. For what I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. He says, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Verse 25, he said, Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. So there's the reading of Romans chapter 7. And in verse 7, so we talk about sin. We see from Romans chapter 7, verse 8, sin distorts God's law. Notice what, people, what Paul said. Sin, he says, seizing an opportunity through the commandment proclaimed in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, he says, sin lies dead. For sin seizing an opportunity, verse 11, through the commandment deceived me, and through, and he says, and through it killed me. It did this by deceiving him. Romans chapter 7, verse 11, what we just read. Sin offered more than it can give and never tells us where it will lead. Through this distortion and deception, sin destroyed Paul, causing him to covet and be separated from God. Look at Romans chapter 7, verse 9. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive, he says, and I die. For sin, seizing an opportunity, verse 11, through the commandment deceived me, and through it killed me. Now look at for 13. He says, did that which is good then bring death to me? He said, by no means. It was sin 
that is missing the mark, harmatia, producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. Sin was made alive and Paul died, but sin did not stop there. Sin progressed to dominate Paul. And that's what we see in Romans chapter 7 and in verse 14. And so <clears throat> sin offers more than it can give and never tells where it leads. And as we saw, it destroyed Paul. In Romans chapter 7 and verse 15, we find he says, he said, for we know the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh. Verse 15, for I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. You see the conflict going on within Paul's mind. Verse 16, he says, now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. There's that ongoing battle. He said, I do that nothing. He said, for I know that nothing good dwells in me. That is my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. That is not by itself, because verse 24, of course, is the key to the whole thing. He said, for uh, continuing on, I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep doing. He said, I do contrary to really what I want to do is what he says there. He said, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me, within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. He said, for I delight in the law of God in my inner being. He says, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man, here's the key that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? That's the question. He answers that question in verse 25. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's who will deliver him. That's who will deliver us. So then I myself serve the law of God within my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. So it's with God's help through Christ that we're able to do that. Verse 15, he says, I do not understand my actions, for I do not do what I want, but the very thing that I hate. <clears throat> now, we rarely think about the ultimate end of our actions when we argue over drawing lines. We can easily convince ourselves that our little foray into whatever issue is safe. And that's what we wish wish to do. We wish to justify a lot of times what we want to do, but if we see it in someone else, then we don't. Now, understand, no alcoholic thought their first social drink would lead them to alcoholic denomina uh, domination, not denomination, domination. <laughs> Consider Dave B., now, whose story is told in a book by Alcoholics Anonymous, their main manual, that's called The Big Book. That's what it's called. It is a big book. Now, he did not think his life would be ruined when he took his first drink. He was afraid merely that his school friends would not like him if he did not go along. He had no idea alcohol would get him in an accident that would cost him his toes and fracture his skull. And who knew alcohol would cause a brain hemorrhage that would paralyze half his body? He had no idea alcohol would send him to jail 
put him in a psych ward, cost him his job and almost his family before he finally started on the road to recovery. On the other hand, no, uh, no one addicted to pornography and sex thought their first foray into lust would lead them into slavery. Consider, if, if you will, the personal story we find in the white book that is, once again, this one's written by Sexaholics Anonymous. That's like Alcoholics Anonymous, but for those who have problems with sex. There's an unnamed man that had no idea his lust would destroy his ability to have relationships with other people, including his wife and children, destroying his marriage. He did not know it would ruin his schooling as he studied theolo theology in seminary and cost him his job as an associate in a local church. He had no idea it would lead him to rely on prostitutes, become a pimp, put his life in danger from disease as well as criminals, and he never guessed he would go so far as to be arrested by the vice squad. And he thanked God for this wake-up call and swore off immorality, but was back on the streets looking for another sexual hit as soon as he was released. Strange story, isn't it? But a true story from the white book. Now, question is, where did this unknown person's descent start? He was born in the 1930s, and his nosedive into dom domination of sin began with Flash Gordon comics. Can you imagine with comics? Azura, the scantily clad queen of magic, destroyed him as a child, and he did not even know it until he was an adult. That's where it started. Innocently. Comic books. Can you imagine? So allow me one disclaimer. I'm not saying everyone who ever submits to one sip of alcohol or glimpse of immodesty is destined for sin's domination in these areas. I simply want us to recognize the moving nature of lines. Now, if we do not answer this question well, we won't merely miss a question on a test. We may well destroy our own souls. Granted, I know none of us will completely avoid this domination and death. Romans 3, 23 says we all sin and fall short of God's glory. However, the better we answer these questions of lines when we are young, the better off we will be and easier it will be to follow Jesus as we grow old. Now there's guideposts on the path as we go through life. Much like a roadway, imagine you can see two paths heading away from you as your feet, at your feet, it is hard to distinguish them. As they progress away from you, they start to diverge, but are so close, it appears they go to the same place. It looks as though you can easily keep you know, go back and forth between them. However, do not be deceived. If you linger longer, oh, that's a restaurant in Ohio. If you linger long on sin's broad and easy path leading to destruction, you will eventually 
hit a point of no return. And not that it is impossible to get back to the path of righteousness. However, there will be a point that doing so will take drastic and painful measures that might be like removing an eye or cutting off an arm. Notice, if you will, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 29 says this very thing. How do we tell these two paths apart, especially when they are still so close they may appear indistinguishable? Well, let me begin to answer that question. I'm notoriously bad about getting distracted while driving, especially on long trips. I don't know how many times I've missed turns, made wrong turns, gone the wrong direction on a highway only to waste about an hour on a trip and have to go back and retrace those steps. I often wake up out of whatever mental fog was distracting me to wonder, am I going in the right way? Am I even on the right road? I immediately start looking for road signs. For example, I'm supposed to be on Highway 124, and I find myself on a twisting, turning 555. I start looking for those little signs that identify the highway. And I'm supposed to be heading west or north and find out all at once I'm heading south on 124 instead of maybe 555 or I'm heading uh, west on Highway 555 and I'm supposed to be heading south along the Ohio River on Highway 124. So get you get distracted. And there's a you know a long way, there's no direct way to go from 124 to get on 555. It's going to take some backtracking across US 50, go up a little ways, and you get there by the restaurant linger longer, and there's where you make your left and you get on 555. Distractions. So signposts are important. GPSs today are important. I'm glad they invented the GPS. I remember the days of the paper maps that get everywhere, and my dad would have my mom reading the map. Sometimes she'd read it upside down. Now, that would be fun. You try that. Try to get where you're going with the maps up, upside down. And I'd hear them fussing, hey, you've got to get that map the right direction. So here's some signposts on the path to following the Lord. The first one to ask is, can I do this thing, whatever it is I want to do, in the name of the Lord? Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17 says that everything we do, to do it in the name of the Lord, giving thanks to the Father. If Jesus were right here next to us, could we say, I'm doing this with your permission and blessing? Can you drink what you're drinking in Jesus' name? Can you eat what you're eating or as much as you are eating in Jesus' name? Can you look at what you're looking at in Jesus' name? Can you touch what you are touching in Jesus' name? Can you go where you're going in Jesus' name? As you answer this question, remember Romans chapter 14 and in verse 23. If you cannot do what you're doing with absolute conviction of faith, that is it, right? Then stop. It is not from faith. It is sin. Am I pursuing a course of the flesh are following the lead of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16. 
Paul says, I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. Remember what he was talking about in Romans chapter 7 here? He kind of goes at it again. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, revelries, distensions, divisions, envy, <clears throat> drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. He said, I warned you as I warned you before that those who, he says, do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Then he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And so if we live by the Spirit... Let us also keep in step with the Spirit. So am I providing for the lust of the flesh? This is an extension of that last guidepost in Romans chapter 13. And in verse 14, it says, We must not make provision for the flesh to gratify its desires or lust. I once read an interesting definition of lust, an attitude demanding that a natural instinct serve unnatural desires. Get that? Isn't that a good definition? When I eat food to calm my nerves, overcome boredom, deal with depression, I'm demanding a natural instinct serve unnatural desires. That is not why God gave us food. When I drink, and especially alcohol, to help me relax, help me socialize, help me escape reality, I'm demanding a natural instinct serve unnatural desires. When I desire sexuality in order to deal with stress, forget my troubles, overcome my insecurities. I'm demanding a natural instinct serve unnatural desires. Are we expecting natural instincts and desires to fulfill ends for which they were never designed? Number four, what direction does this action I want to take lead? Providing for the lust of the flesh is not exactly the same as feeding them. It is true that going to the water park or the beach is not the same as actually lusting after a woman. But why are you going? What do you think will happen once you get there? If you if your defense is merely you have decided you'll not lust, how can you guarantee that? Do you remember what we learned from Paul in Romans 7? That is exactly the kind of deception sin wants us to heed. When you provide for the lust of the flesh, do not be surprised when sin deceptively sneaks up and kills you dominating your life. What hunger am I feeling or am I filling with this action? In Matthew chapter 5 and in verse 6, it said those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled. Is the action you are about to take helping you pursue the righteousness for which you are hungry? Or is it helping you pursue a hunger for power, fame, money, pleasure? Why are you working so hard for that promotion, 
promotion in themselves are are not wrong. But if the only hunger you are feeling is the prestige and power, you've crossed the line. Number six, am I professing godliness? Remember 1 Timothy chapter 4 and in verse 7. I've got the wrong passage up there, but we'll get to 1 Timothy 4 here in a minute. That was 1 Timothy 2.10. Paul told Timothy to teach women to dress in a way that professes godliness. Now, am I showing reverence to God with some movie maybe I'm watching that, or that I'm about to watch? What about with the song with which I'm singing on the radio? Singing with? Does the joke I'm about to tell show reverence, piety, and respect for God? Or are my actions dishonoring? Do not forget, as Christians, we wear the name of Christ. Everything we do reflects on Him. And it does it, does it do it in honor or in dishonor? Do my actions demonstrate that I'm set apart for holiness and sanctification, that is set apart for His service. First Thessalonians in chapter 4, verse 1 says, God did not call us for impurity, but for holiness. His will for us is sanctification. Sanctification means being set apart for His holy use, like the vessels of the Old Testament that were set apart and cleansed to be used in the temple of God. We are to be cleansed and set apart for God's holy use in this world. Does the way I walk and talk tell people I am set apart for holy use by God? Do my clothes say I'm set apart for holy use by God? Do the messages on my clothes say I'm set apart for holy use by God? Or do they say I am just like the rest of the world, pursuing a course of popularity, prestige, and pleasure? Now, final thought. I put that sign up there because I know you like, you're like you glad this sermon is over, this lesson is over. But just like when we are on road trips, we have to look for the signs to make sure we are on the right road. And we use those these questions that we've just went over as guideposts to help us see if we're on God's path of righteousness. Draw these lines well when you're young. And overcome sin will always be easier for you if you draw these, learn to draw these lines when you're young. Please do not let sin deceive you. And do not let it draw you in to see how far you can go. It will always take you further than you are ever expected to go. Follow these guideposts. Make wise decisions and overcome sin. However, if you have already entered sin's domination, I do not want you to leave without hope. As Paul said in Romans chapter 7, verse 24 and 25, he said, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of death? That's the question. Then he says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus can deliver you. Throw yourself on the mercy, on his mercy and grace. Allow him to live through you. It will not always be easy. But his path leads to life. Get on it today. Be baptized into Christ and into his death. Be set free from your sins by the blood of Jesus Christ. Romans 6, 3 
and four. And with that, cheerio, mate, Bob's your uncle. The Bible reveals to us God's plan for saving man. God has had a plan from the beginning. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, we learn it, for by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourself, it is a gift of God, God's grace, His unmerited favor toward us. Then Christ shed His blood much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Then we learn that the gospel is important. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God to salvation, the Holy Spirit's gospel. And then the faith, our faith, the sinner's faith. They said to him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You shall be saved, you and your household. His faith would lead him to obey the gospel plan of salvation. Then we learn the confession of the sinner that I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Acts 8, verse 37, but also Romans 10, 10, with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Then we learn part of God's plan for saving man is the sinner's repentance, Acts 17, verse 30. Truly, the, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Then we must be baptized. He says there's also an antitype which now saves us baptism. He says not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God and in the Christian is has work to do we learn in james chapter 2 verse 24 you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only the only place the bible uses faith and only is to say we're not justified by faith only the christian has hope romans 8 and verse 24 for we were saved in this hope, but hope that is not is seen, that is seen, is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? One more time. Romans 8 and 24. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? And then we learn Revelation 2.10, Do not fear any of these things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful in the death and I will give you the crown of life. Matthew 10.22, We are to endure to the end to be saved. 1 Corinthians 15.58, Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing this, that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. If you found this video helpful and wish to learn more, be sure you download the note card that goes with this lesson and our free four-lesson Bible correspondence course you will find the links in the description below. We here at the Spring Hill Church of Christ meeting at 405 Butler Street in Spring Hill, Louisiana, want to help you with your growth and your knowledge of God's Word. Remember, we are in it for the likes and the subs, so be sure to like us, subscribe to our channel, and tell others. Thanks for watching. In the meantime, in between time, we will see you next time. Cheerio, mate. And with that, Bob's your uncle.